Welcome to the Autism Empowerment Podcast, your source for acceptance, enrichment, inspiration, and empowerment in autistic and autism communities worldwide. Wherever you identify in your autism or autistic journey, Autism Empowerment is here to meet you along the way. We are an autistic-led podcast, 501c3 nonprofit charity, and publisher of Spectrum Life magazine. In today's episode, we'll be talking about common early signs of autism in children. We'll discuss resources available for free in the CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early program and next steps to take if you're concerned about your child's development. And we're back in the studio. Hey there, Karen. Hello, John. How's my favorite co-host today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. It looks like we're going to have some snow out there, but not in the studio. (laughs) <laughs> I hope it won't be snowing in the studio. I'm, I'm praying that won't be. <laughs> Thanks for the weather update. Sometimes it feels like it's cold enough. Probably. It's been a while since we've had snow of any magnitude here in Vancouver, Washington. When we were designing the cover of our recent issue of Spectrum Life magazine, we deliberately chose a photo of a mom and child playing in the snow. Probably because I really wanted there to be snow. The funny thing about that, at the time, there was no snow. (laughs) There was no snow. Now that it's early February 2021, I'd say it was pretty good timing. So in case any of our listeners didn't get a chance to pick up a copy of our winter issue of Spectrum Life magazine, you can do so for free at www.spectrumlife.org. With that being said, hello to our listeners. And whether you're here with us for the first time or you're a returning guest, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Karen Krejcia, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of Autism Empowerment and one of your hosts for today's podcast. I'm here with my husband, John Krejcia, who's our program's director and other co-founder. Welcome to all of our listeners out there. Today, we're on episode number seven, and we'll be discussing the CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early program. We'll then be highlighting common early signs of autism in children. For now, I'm going to turn this over to John to take on the primary duties of asking questions and helping keep track of the clock for this episode. I'll be happy to be the master of ceremonies today. You are full of witticisms. Do you try to come up with different things each time? I do try very hard. So let's get back to the show (laughs) or we won't have any more listeners. Why are we going over this today, Karen? Well, John, in episode six, we focused on reaching out to parents who were new to their child's autism diagnosis or considered themselves early on in their journey. We shared wisdom and advice from an autistic mother and discussed Jasmine Jones' article, When the Best Therapy is Love. After finishing that episode and realizing how powerful it was, you and I got into a discussion. We both realized that while speaking to parents new to diagnosis or early in the autism journey is incredibly important, It was also essential to reach out to parents who would benefit from learning the early signs of autism, including what to look for and how initiatives like the CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early program are so helpful in assisting parents to track their children's developmental milestones. Well, that makes sense why we're going over that today. I know we get quite a few questions about common signs of autism and developmental delay. In fact, one of our columns that we had in Spectrum Life last year, I believe, addressed that. Yes, we do get a lot of questions. People are concerned about their children's developmental milestones. And so one of the questions that had actually come in to me last year was interesting, and I'll read the intro on that. Okay. Dear Spectrum Life, I recently gave birth to my first son. My husband, who's on the spectrum, has a six-year-old daughter from his first marriage who's also autistic. We wanted to know what kind of things we should look out for in terms of development with our son. How did you answer the question to the parent? Whenever we get these questions in, I do send pretty extensive emails to people with details and resources. Then when we actually answer them in the magazine, we may not have as much space. I tend to craft the answers to more of a general audience since a lot of people will ask similar types of questions. So first, autism is considered a developmental disorder that affects communication and behavior. And although autism can be diagnosed at any age, it's said to be a developmental disorder or in some cases developmental difference because symptoms generally appear in the first two years of life. It's important for people to know that autism will occur in all ethnic, racial, and economic groups. Although autism is lifelong, treatments and services can improve a person's symptoms and challenges and their ability to function. All children, including those on the autism spectrum, develop at different rates in different areas. Areas where autistic children, and also adults, commonly have challenges include executive functioning, if you think about organization, language, social and learning, motor skills, 
perception, and also sensory filtering. Some children show hints of future problems within the first few months of life. In others, symptoms may not show up until 24 months or later. Some children seem to develop typically until around 18 to 24 months of age, and then they appear to stop gaining new skills, or they may appear to regress or lose the skills they once had. That's something that we experienced with our youngest child. Yes, it was. Children may have delays in language, social and learning skills, while their ability to walk and move around could be the same as other children their age. They might be very good at doing things like putting puzzles together or solving computer problems, but they might have trouble with social activities like talking or making friends or keeping the friends that they make. Children on the spectrum might also learn a hard skill before they learn an easy one. This can be difficult to understand, but if I was to give an example, I'd say sometimes a child might be able to read long words or memorize songs before they're able to tell you what sound a D or a B makes. So what should a a parent do if they have any concerns? We're going to be talking a little bit later in this show about specific concerns or early signs in autism. But if you have a concern with the way your child plays or learns or speaks or acts or moves, it's really important to talk to your child's doctor and share your concerns. You don't want to wait because acting early can make a real difference. Your child's doctor can perform a developmental screening. What that is, is a short test to tell if your children are learning basic skills when they should or if they might have delays. A screening is not meant to establish a diagnosis for the child, but rather to help professionals determine whether a more in-depth assessment is the next step. During a developmental screening, the doctor might ask you some questions or they might talk or play with your child during the exam to try to observe and see how they learn, speak, behave, and move. A delay in any of these areas could be a sign of a problem or challenge. For more information about this, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC, has a website set up, and we will include links in the podcast show notes. This will also be in the transcript as well at our www.autismempowermentpodcast.org website. I was going to make that suggestion as well. (laughs) (laughs) You were. Yeah, so specifically in relation to concerns, if you go to cdc.gov forward slash concerned, that will take you specifically to that section. So Karen, what do you think? Should all children be screened? That is the recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics. All children should be screened for developmental delays and disabilities during regular well-child doctor visits. These generally take place at nine months, 18 months, 24 months, or 30 months. Additional screening might be needed if a child is at high risk for developmental problems due to a preterm birth, low birth weight, or other reasons. It's also important to note that children who have siblings or other family members who might be on the autism spectrum have higher odds of also being autistic. During this process, parents' experiences and concerns are very important in that screening process for young children. Sometimes the doctor will ask parents questions about their child's behaviors and combine those answers with information from milestone charts or from autism screening tools in combination with observations about the child. Children who show developmental differences during the screening process will be referred for a second stage of evaluation. What if your child's doctor has told you, just let's wait and see? But you feel uneasy about that. Yeah, so that can be really tricky because people have a tendency sometimes to just naturally trust their doctors. And of course, doctors have a lot of medical experience and training and practice, but you are going to know your child better than the doctor who is only going to see your child sporadically. So as wonderful as your doctor may be, if you are feeling uneasy about the advice that he or she is giving and they tell you to wait and see, it's important for you to talk with another doctor and get a second opinion. You can also call for a free evaluation to find out if your child can get free or low-cost services that can help. If your child is under three years old, call your state's early intervention program, and we'll go ahead and link to that in the show notes, but the website link is www.cdc.gov forward slash find EI. If your child is three or older, call your local public elementary school. It's important to note that you do not need a doctor's referral to have your child evaluated for services. If you're feeling awkward and are not sure what to say or you'd like some additional information, including tips on making these important calls, you can go to www.cdc.gov 
forward slash concerned. What kind of support does the CDC or Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have? First, John, I want to put this out there. Autism is not a disease. So it can seem strange that you'd be going to the CDC site to learn about developmental milestones and these kinds of things. However, they do track health, and you'll find in your journey as a parent that there are a lot of different government agencies that kind of intermingle and interact in terms of health things. So just go with that, okay? (laughs) Sounds good. So, So they have a program called Learn the Signs, Act Early. The program aims to improve early identification of children with autism and also other developmental disabilities so that children and families can get the services and support they need as early as possible. Children develop at their own pace, so it can be difficult to tell exactly when a child is going to learn a particular skill, but there are age-specific developmental milestones used to measure a child's social and emotional progress in the first few years of life. The link for the Learn the Signs Act Early program is cdc.gov forward slash act early, but you can also call 1-800-CDC-INFO or 1-800-232-4636. And don't worry, we'll have these all in the show notes as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of the things I really like about the CDC is that they offer a wide range of different types of parent-friendly materials, and they're research-based, they're free, and they're easily accessible and customizable. So whether you want to see something in video, you want to download it as a PDF, you want to have something mailed to you, there's a lot of different options that are available for you. They have materials available for parents for early educators and healthcare providers. Is it only in English? The materials are available in English and Spanish, and then some of them are available in other languages. Other things that are on the site are milestone checklists, tips for parents, early warning signs, fact sheets, and other materials that they can download or order for free. One of the really neat things that they've developed is a CDC milestone tracker app that you can use on your phone or mobile device. From birth to age five, your child should be reaching certain milestones in how they play and how they learn, speak, act, and move. You can track your child's milestones from age two months all the way up to five years with their Milestone Tracker app. One of the neat things about it, too, is that they have photos and videos in the app to illustrate what each milestone might look like. It makes tracking them for your child a lot easier and fun, too. What are some of the features of the app? Well, first, you can add a child. In fact, you can enter personalized information about your child or multiple children, which is great for parents who have more than one child that are in that age range. That milestone tracker is there where you can track your child's developmental progress by looking for important milestones using their interactive illustrated checklist. As I mentioned before, they have the milestone photos and videos so that you can know what each milestone looks like to better identify them in your own child. In the app, they also include tips and activities to support your child's development at every age, know when it's time to act early and talk with your child's doctor about developmental concerns. You can even keep track of your child's doctor's appointments and get reminders about recommended developmental screenings. Finally, one of the most beneficial features of the app is a milestone summary, where you can get a summary of your child's milestones to view and share with or email to your child's doctor and their other important care providers. You can download the app for free on either iOS or Android devices in both English and Spanish. That sounds like a really helpful app. So now that we talked about that, I want to pivot a little bit. I want to go back to the common signs of autism in children. Sure. Can we talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, because the things that we were talking about, the CDC's Learn the Signs Act early program, as well as the app, those will track other types of developmental milestones and potential developmental delays. They're not necessarily autism specific. So let's go back to talking about common signs of autism in children. Because autism is a spectrum, correct? Autism is a spectrum, and it's known as a spectrum because there's a wide variation in the type and the severity of symptoms that people experience. If we're to first of all think about autism in general, if you were to have your child or an adult or yourself diagnosed, there's a few different hallmarks that are being looked at for diagnostic criteria. One is difficulty with communication and interaction with other people. The second would be restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. Then finally, symptoms that affect the person's ability to function in school, in work, and other areas of life. So those things have to be present. So now we're going to talk a bit 
about some of the different early signs and how that might break down. Understand that not every child is going to experience every symptom. Some of these things may not present until they're older. Some may not present at all. To make it easier to process these when you're listening to this over a podcast, we're going to try to break these down into different types of categories. One of the big ones that comes up is avoiding eye contact. This would be if you were talking to a child and you were looking at them, but they did not look back at you. Now, oftentimes, speaking as an autistic woman here and speaking as someone who was once an autistic child, I needed to be able to process what another person was saying. I wouldn't necessarily look them in the eye, but I was listening. It can also be a sensory issue. Looking somebody in the eye can be very intense. This is very common. So if a child avoids eye contact, that might be an early sign for autism. Another sign might be if they don't look at something when another person points to it, trying to get their attention. An example might be if you saw a dog walking past a window outside and you pointed to it and your child seemed to ignore you. Along the same lines of ignoring, if a child doesn't respond to their name by 12 months of age, that can be an early sign of autism. Can we move on to some of the sensory issues? All children, all adults on the spectrum have some sort of sensory issue. Children on the spectrum often have unusual reactions to the way things sound, smell, taste, look, or feel. I like to describe this as having your senses with the radio dial turned up high. So for a child who's a super sniffer, for example, they're going to be able to smell popcorn or pizza or a bad smell or perfume or whatever the smell might be from a lot further distance than a typical person would. They might be very hypersensitive to noise. Balloons popping was a horrible one for me. Sudden noises. In fact, you'll often see children on the spectrum with accommodations in school having headphones because it is so loud that it's painful. Light can be a problem. You can have real sensitivity to light and sunglasses and certain types of lenses may help you. Lights can also buzz and oftentimes children will notice and be disturbed by the sound of a light when no one else in the room seems to hear it. One of the common things that you'll hear in terms of senses with kids on the spectrum and also kids who have other sensory processing challenges is that they're either sensory seekers or sensory avoiders. That could be difficult if you have two kids and they're opposites. Absolutely. If you want to throw something else in the mix, it can be different from time to time. An example of a sensory avoider might be someone who has sensitivity to the tags in their clothing. This may look like having to cut the tags out of every shirt that you own and having to get socks that are seamless because they just can't put their feet into them. Certain fabrics are going to be itchy. Some fabrics are going to just feel really itchy and uncomfortable. Sensory seekers are craving stimulation. They might like to jump and crash into pillows They might want to immerse themselves into sensory experiences because they're really trying to crave that input. Like wrapping themselves up or swaddling themselves up really tight? Yes, that's a perfect example. Also, sniffing. Remember those scratch and sniff stickers there were back in the 80s? Some were pretty bad. (laughs) Yeah, sniff. Smells. Oh, my goodness. I've heard children come to me and say, I smell this, the smell, this hairspray smell from my grandmother. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I know those people are really the s- super sniffers out there. Oh, gosh, hairspray is horrible. People can have sensory challenges and sensory issues and not be on the spectrum. A common one is being able to go outside when it's super cold and wear shorts. Hey, wait a minute. That's me. <laughs> it's me. It's our kids. It's especially you in the snow. But yeah, that's actually a common thing I can remember. And this is actually something we hear from so many parents. It's please, how can I get my child to put on their jacket? <laughs> You're probably not going to be able to. <laughs> Even if you get them to put on their jacket, they're going to take it off. So we have snow coming up soon. That's going to be a challenge for many. In this and area. I'm sure our kids will be out in the snow in that. Yes, but we need to keep them healthy and we need to keep them safe. So Absolutely. even when these things do challenge us, we need to try to work with them. A lot of kids just don't like clothes at all. And especially when they're young, they'll be the ones that are going to be throwing off their diapers, throwing off any clothes that they have and just running around the house and wanting to be free. Let's move on to speech. One of the more common things is delayed speech and language skills. 
This may even be regression. That's kind of like our child, about 18 months, he regressed. Right. Up until that point, he seemed to be meeting his developmental milestones, and he had a number of words and was saying some of the more typical ones, mama, dada, ball, hi, bye, those types of things. But then it just seemed to regress and stop. Although I believe he still had the vocabulary, he wasn't able to access it to verbalize it. So that was one sign that something different was going on that we needed to have him evaluated. Some children on the spectrum do not have delayed speech and language skills. In fact, some of them are very verbal and might be quite advanced in that area. So it isn't always something you're going to notice. But you may notice the way that they talk. Some children on the spectrum tend to talk in a flat voice, almost robotic-like, or sing song. Or even have voice modulation issues. That's very common, too. In fact, you'll wonder if perhaps your child might be hard of hearing because they'll be talking so loudly. And then some whisper really soft. And it's difficult because you want them to participate, but they need to repeat themselves. You just can't understand what they're saying. Another thing about speech, and this goes more into language and understanding, is that a lot of children on the spectrum have challenges understanding sarcasm or idioms or jokes. Especially when they're younger, you can memorize these things and learn them along the way. But idioms, that's, boy, a lot of children on the spectrum, adults on the spectrum, were literal thinkers. So if we hear something, we picture it literally. And one of the ones I remember when I was a kid was, it's raining cats and dogs. Yikes, watch out, you may step in poodles. (laughs) Yeah, so literally I was visualizing cats and dogs coming out of the sky and what a horrible thought that was. Why would someone say something like that? So oftentimes you need to teach, and that's not intuitive to anybody, you do have to explain it to them. But even after explaining it, a lot of kids may have real trouble getting those types of jokes and idioms and not find them funny. Some kids I know really use sarcasm well and can really understand it. But then there's others that it just goes over their head and they don't get it. With our youngest child, I purposely use sarcasm quite a bit to help him understand the difference. And now he's very sarcastic back to me. (laughs) But he is a teenager. Yeah, that's true. He is a teen. Sometimes children also have trouble understanding social niceties, social manners, understanding how to react to rhetorical questions like small talk. I remember being so confused when people go, how are you? What's up? And I would want to give them probably three or four sentences, perhaps a few paragraphs about exactly how I was doing. And they were already gone. So what's up? but they're really not wanting to know what's up. That's pretty funny. And I couldn't get that. Those types of norms that other kids seem to pick up on naturally are things that children on the spectrum struggle with. They can learn them, but it isn't necessarily intuitive and it may never be. Other things might be that they reverse their pronouns when they talk. They might say you instead of I. They might mix letters around aminal instead of animal. And also, they may give unrelated answers to questions. So let's now move on to physical. A lot of kids on the spectrum have challenge with both fine motor skills and gross motor skills. For those fine motor skills like writing or cutting with scissors, that can be very difficult, especially for those out there who are left-handed, right? It's already challenging. Gross motor skills... They may have trouble learning how to ride a bike. They might have trouble running. They may have trouble with balance. For example, walking on a tightrope or one of those balance bars. They may have low muscle tone and it would be difficult for them to do a push-up or a pull-up. For me, I could never do a cartwheel. So all the girls were out there doing cartwheels. I'm like, let me just go play kickball and baseball and football. But no, 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 no. Gymnastics was so tough. So other physical things that will be probably quite noticeable because it seems unusual, might be if you see a child that flaps their hands, if they rock their body back and forth, if they walk on their toes, or if they spin in circles. In many cases, that is a sign that they're regulating their body, and that's okay, but it's a different way than a lot of people choose to do so, and it tends to be more prevalent in kids that are on the spectrum. What about emotional? What are some signs there? A lot of children on this spectrum have trouble understanding facial expressions at first. 
And then their own facial expressions and movements and gestures may not match what's being said. Sometimes they may misinterpret things and laugh inappropriately. For example, I remember when we were in a restaurant when our youngest was, I don't know, two, three, and someone at the table across from us sneezed. And he laughed uncontrollably. <laughs> he just laughed and laughed. And then they sneezed again and he kept laughing. And Inside, I was laughing, but I was composed. And we yeah. quietly said that they shouldn't be laughing. Yes. It's one of those parent moments where you have a tendency to kind of want to either laugh along with the kid or feel really embarrassed and ashamed and want to crawl under the table. I tend to be the one that wants to laugh. But that can um, cause some issues as well. I know one time at school, there was a minor issue and he started laughing. And that became a larger issue because it devolved into disrespect and all of that Mm -hmm. when that wasn't the case. Yeah, a lot of times they might laugh when they aren't supposed to. They don't appear to feel sad when perhaps one might think they should. So this is a pretty big one, particularly in this last year. A lot of children on the spectrum get really upset by minor changes in their routine. Now, this can be their schedule. And certainly with COVID-19, all of us were going through the experience of having changes in our routine. But for a child on the spectrum, it might be something like they've changed the box on your favorite cereal or they've changed the recipe in the chicken nuggets. Those things, you're going to see incredible behavioral reactions because it's something that they expect and it's something that doesn't happen. I know Michelinia's macaroni and cheese changed their box several times, which caused several eating changes. Children can be very attached to certain things, certain brands, certain shirts, certain clothing, right? So our children like their routines, and children on the spectrum especially. That structure helps them. The lack of it can be very disconcerting. That can lead to changes in behavior. All behavior is a form of communication. Challenges with impulse control That could be another sign of early autism in a child. So another emotional thing might be having trouble understanding other people's feelings or talking about their own feelings. Sometimes being able to take the perspective of another person or get into their shoes. I know sometimes people on the spectrum are told they have that problem with theory of mind. But in reality, I've noticed that people that are not on the spectrum have just as much of a difficult time trying to imagine what it's like to be autistic as autistic people may have to try to figure out what it's not. So when it comes to play, let's talk about that a little bit. These are going to be the types of things that you'll see doctors try to evaluate in the office or they will be asking you questions about how your child plays One of the most common things that you'll see with kids that are on the spectrum is that they line up their toys. They may organize their toys or their objects in a specific way. They might do it by height. They might do it by color. They might be doing it by set. Our youngest, he used to love to line up his cars. He would organize them by number. Sometimes he'd organize them by color or by make but they would always be organized in a set. Instead of playing with the car, let's zoom it around the track, his play with the cars would be lining them up and organizing them, which to me is a very creative form of play, but it's different than how you might see a child without autism do it. I know one time we went to pick him up at camp and all of these people had done these Lego types of projects. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to our youngest, he had his all lined up by color and shape and size. And I thought it was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. To me, that's brilliant. That's organization. But it it was interesting because every other child was full of all these different colors and they seemed kind of abstract. And our kids was just nice and neat and organized. To me, it was very organized. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes our kids will play with their toys in very different types of ways. They might like the wheels of an object. They might be interested in taking something apart and putting it back together. A lot of times they're just trying to understand how things are working, the mechanics of things. Now, that isn't for everybody, but I've seen that quite a bit. In terms of play, our kids and adults tend to have really passionate interests. Our children tend to be very passionate about certain things. They'll get into one particular subject, and then they'll just love on that subject for an extended period of time. Then one day it just might completely switch 
or they might keep it for their entire life, or it might go away for a couple years and then come back. They'll become the little professors, won't they? Yes. And so one of the things that I hear parents talk about, of course, is whatever passion their child is into. Fortunately or unfortunately, it tends to be that children like to listen to the same song or movie over and over again. What is the one about, was it Little Shark? When our kids were young, it was Barney or Bob the Builder. Whatever it might be, you just have to go with it because they will go with it. And it could drive you a little bit bonkers, but it's their passion. It's their interest. So if you notice that your child has a special interest that they're incredibly passionate about and very detailed about, that could also be a sign that they might be on the spectrum. For example, if they want to listen to the same song 15 times in a row or the same movie 15 times in a row, they may have everything memorized, but they'll want to see it or hear it again and again. That is actually pretty common. And you'll have some camaraderie among other autism parents because they'll be sharing the different types of passions that their kids are interested in. Whether... And what movie or song they've had to listen to a hundred <laughs> times. I still like to listen to the same songs on loop. It helps me focus, but I know that it drives other people bonkers. So I have to, I have to do <laughs> it when other people aren't around, but I find a benefit in it. Can we talk briefly about girls and some things that may be signs there? So autism tends to be diagnosed in boys much more commonly than it is in girls, and it's more prevalent in boys than girls, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist in girls. And a lot of times, girls just aren't identified, especially early on, because they may be really good at being able to mask certain things socially, whereas it might be more noticeable if a boy is really quiet or sensitive for a girl if they're seen as shy or sensitive, that might not be such a big deal or people might not notice that as a sign that something might be different. A lot of times girls too can come across really bubbly, even the shy ones, or magnanimous. It's a common and also very exhausting way that girls on the spectrum camouflage or mask a lot of their social anxiety. Other people may not have any clue that they might be autistic because in some way, shape, or form, the girl has learned a skill that's helped them hide it. They may not even know they're autistic. They just realize that they're somehow different than other people and some behavior is considered appropriate and some behavior is considered inappropriate by their peers. So girls can often be really good students of reading fashion magazines or studying videos just to try to mask or mimic other girls. That can also mean they can come across a little bit know-it-all sometimes. For the boys you mentioned earlier, that could be sounding like a little professor. They don't mean to do it in order to sound like they're braggadocious or that they feel that they're better. They're just sharing knowledge that they have that they thought that other people might want to know as well. Girls, they may have one friend that's a mother hen that sort of watches over them and protects them. So it might be easier for them to not go as noticed. They can be just as passionate about interests, but it might not be as noticeable because they're into fairies and mermaids like their friends might be, or they might be into animals or fiction like their friends might be, but it's the level of intensity that's different. It's the research, it's the factual knowledge. It might be lining up all of their fairy figurines or their mermaids and creating elaborate fantasy worlds with them. So those are just some different things with girls. I don't want to stereotype people. I don't like that when it happens. But it's something for you to look at. If you're a parent of a girl on the spectrum, this may be how they present in those ways. It just might look a little bit different. So today's show is almost over. But before we leave, can you give us a recap on what we've gone over today? Absolutely. So we kind of finished off there talking about different signs of autism in children, things that you might see early on, as well as behaviors that you might see as they continue to develop into school age. In the beginning of the show, we talked about learning the signs act early program from the CDC. We also went over the CDC milestone tracker app. If you have a concern with the way your child plays, learns, speaks, acts, and moves, Talk to your child's doctor and share your concerns. 
It's important to not wait because acting early can make a real difference in them being able to get supports and services that might be able to help them in their developmental process. The CDC website has a lot of milestone checklists that you can download, print, and keep notes on. You can also utilize the CDC Milestone Tracker app and share your results of that with your child's doctor or other care professionals. If you're concerned about your child's progression, you can ask for a developmental screening. You can do that through the early intervention program in your state if they're under three, and through your child's local elementary school if they're three or older. Make sure that when you're at the doctor's office that you understand what the doctor tells you and what to do next. It would be extremely rare for the initial doctor that you see to make a diagnosis at the point you see them. So understand that if a second evaluation is needed, it's going to be with a team of doctors and other health professionals who are experienced in diagnosing autism. The team may include a developmental pediatrician, who's a doctor who has special training in child development, a child psychologist or a child psychiatrist, which is a doctor who has specialized training in brain development and behavior, a neuropsychologist, which is a doctor who focuses on evaluating, diagnosing, and treating neurological, medical, and neurodevelopmental disorders. There may also be a speech-language pathologist, which is a health professional who has special training in communication difficulties. The second evaluation may assess cognitive level or thinking skills, language abilities, and what are considered age-appropriate skills needed to complete daily activities independently such as eating, or dressing, or toileting. Because autism is a spectrum disorder and is complex, it may also sometimes occur along with other illnesses or learning disorders. Your comprehensive evaluation might include blood tests and a hearing test, and perhaps other evaluations as well. The outcome of your second evaluation often results in a formal diagnosis and recommendations for treatment. We don't want you to feel overwhelmed. We want you to feel informed and empowered to best support your child. We will include links to all of these resources, including the Milestone Checklists and the CDC Milestone Tracker app on our show notes page. We'll include a transcript of this show and we'll have it up on our website within 72 hours of publishing this episode. If it turns out that your child has a developmental delay or is diagnosed on the autism spectrum, know that you're not alone. Your child is the same amazing human being that they were before, but now you can benefit from additional information to be able to support them and help them grow. The journey is going to be filled with ups and downs, but so is life. Please know that there's a lot of support and resources out there, including Autism Empowerment, Spectrum Life Magazine, and our Autism Empowerment Podcast. As we say, autism is a journey. We'll meet you along the way. Life definitely has a lot of ups and downs, loop-de-loops, and all of that. Thank you so much, Karen, for going over all of this today with us. I'm now going to turn it back to you to close this up, but I just want to thank our listeners for tuning in, and I look forward to having you come back. Thank you so much, John. This was a really important episode. You and I both remember what it feels like to have our children diagnosed on the spectrum. We want to try to make it as easy as possible for parents or caregivers, grandparents out there to be able to have the best possible trajectory for their children. When we have these types of discussions, we do so from a place of love and from a place of grace. We do want our listeners to come back and know that they are with people who care. We appreciate you hanging out with us and thank you for your time. You've been listening to the Autism Empowerment Podcast. If you'd like to get connected with our community, as well as all the great support and content we have planned for the future, please hit the subscribe button and visit www.autismempowermentpodcast.org for show notes, transcripts, social media details, Spectrum Life magazine, and more. As a 501c3 nonprofit charity, we rely upon support from listeners like you to produce our podcast and other programs. We appreciate you leaving a positive review, sharing our podcast with others, and considering a tax-deductible donation. Thank you again.